Well, good morning and welcome everybody to Sunday mornings at the Marxist Library. Now, um, since the pandemic, we haven't actually been meeting physically at the Nebel Proctor Marxist Library in Oakland, California. We've been um, going on, on Zoom. So uh, I should wish everybody who is in our audience, like Danny, who's now, yeah, I believe you're in New York City now, Dan, Danny? So uh, right now, I'm, yeah. And uh, so good afternoon, uh, good morning. And for those of you who are even further time zones away, um, good, good, good evening. Um, today, by the way, is um, just a few minutes ago, the Pride Parade started in San Francisco. And um, this is Pride Month. And speaking of Pride, um, the Nebel Proctor Marxist Library, the Sunday mornings at the Marxist Library, we're very proud that this is, um, we've been doing these programs. They've been sponsored by a group called the ICSS. Our website is icssmarx.org. Um, our program committee uh, organizes these events and I'm on the program committee. My name is Roger Harris. And we're very proud that we've been doing this for about 15 years, every Sunday morning. Um, before. And um, I would also uh, in, invite uh, our, our participants to join us. Um, we will first have a presentation for about 45 minutes, and then that'll be followed by a few announcements. And then after the announcements, we will have a, um, uh, a robust Q&A, and Danny will have um, as much time as he would like to uh, respond to questions, but we're going to ask folks maybe to try to um, limit your comments to about two minutes um, so that we can get through as many comments as possible, comments and questions. Um, the, the ICS programs, the Sunday mornings at the Marxist Library, uh, the, the program committee has a has a has an affinity to Marx. We believe that Karl Marx is, is as relevant today as he was when he originally wrote his um motto, uh, the motto that we've taken from his 11th thesis on Feuerbach, that philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. But you don't have to be a Marxist to join our programs or to pre present as long as you present some um progressive ideas. Um, so I, I would say that that um, we're very happy to have our, our speaker today. The topic of our discussion today is Haiti, an anti-imperialist perspective. The U.S. is spearheading an effort to reinvade and occupy, reoccupy Haiti. And, and that's according to our speaker who last visited the, the Island Republic last month. Our speaker, Danny Shaw, will report on different ingredients in the neo-colonial hybrid war in Port-au-Prince, the, the capital of Haiti, um, the guns, the so-called gangs, the neo-colonial state. He's been working with the Haitian left, both in Haiti and in the diaspora since 1998. And um, Danny speaks Creole and has been um, a Creole speaker since 1998. Uh, Danny teaches um, Latin American and Caribbean studies, race and ethnicity, class and gender at the City University of New York. He holds a master's in international affairs from Columbia University, and he's worked and organized in 70 different countries, opening his spirit to countless testimonies about the inhumanity of international ec economic system. His wor he, he works with RT International, Telesur, and is a senior research fellow with the Council on Hemispheric Relations. Not only that, but Danny is also a retired Golden Gloves boxer, and he fought twice in Madison Square Garden for the New York City Heavyweight Championship. He teaches boxing, yoga, and nutrition, and works as a sober coach, in addition to his professorial work, keeping young people out of the military and prison industrial complex. He is the father of two young life warriors and mentors many to the nutritional, ideological, social, and emotional landlines, landmines that surround us. He is the author of six books and numerous articles. In addition, 
Danny just returned from Venezuela. So hoping, Danny, that you'll um, make um, some comments about that. He participated in an international forum and protest over the third year of incarceration by the United States of political prisoner Alex Saab, a man whose crime was procuring humanitarian supplies, food, medicine, and fuel to legal trade but in contravention to the illegal U.S. blockade of Venezuela. So, Danny, take it over, please. Beautiful. Thanks so much, Roger, for the introduction. Thank you for the uh, invite. I gave a talk maybe two, three uh, years ago. The talk was entitled 50 Years After the Panthers' Dope Plus Capitalism Still Equals uh, Genocide. And uh, I'll never forget my longtime comrade, Fred Mentor, <clears throat> uh, Gary Hicks uh, introduced me on that occasion, which was uh, which was very beautiful. We lost Gary in uh, early um, December. We had a beautiful memorial, so I wanted to just take a second to recognize Gary's uh, leadership and mentorship. And in People's World, I published a tribute. If you haven't seen it, I just put it in the uh, chat. I really tried to capture who Gary was as an organic intellectual of of our class. <clears throat> so. I'll speak on Haiti, 25-minute um, range. Let me make sure I started my timer here. Give you an overview. What are the principal issues uh, going on? Came back from Haiti about uh, a month ago. I think one place to start is that Port-au-Prince is not Haiti, and Haiti is not Port-au-Prince. So much of mainstream corporate journalism when they're talking about Brazil, they're always talking about Sao Paulo, they're talking about Rio de Janeiro, but they're not taking into account all the different experiences across Brazil. Well, it's the same in, in Haiti. The violence, the kidnapping, kidnappings, the gang phenomena right now are concentrated in uh, the city of Port-au-Prince. Port-au-Prince is a city of 2.7 million, uh, the uh, Haiti total population is 11.5 million. And then in the diaspora, you have a lot, another 3 million with the highest concentration of Haitians being in Southern Florida. Some of the work that I was uh, doing out there was trying to track where all the guns are coming from. Haiti does not produce guns. The Dominican Republic does not produce guns. The Caribbean in general does not produce guns. This constant um, conferences by CARICOM nations trying to figure out where all these guns are coming from. I think the United States State Department participates in a very hypocritical way because all of the research that I've built upon and looked at, almost without exception, all of the guns are coming from the U.S., um, I'm writing an article now that the U.S.'s gun crisis is also Haiti's gun crisis. What we're seeing in 2023, what we've seen now really for decades, is that the neocolonies, the U.S. neocolonies, are very porous. And in the case of, of Haiti, I was breaking down the dynamics. An average Haitian dock worker, customs worker is, you know, making in the range perhaps of $100 to $150 per month. So these smugglers who have their straw buyers in Florida, they pay others to buy so they can build up uh, as much ammunition as they can. They've used such entities as the Episcopalian Church and their big crates of uh, donations. They've used um, uh, all types of, of imports of, of food. I was looking for an exact number, but it's a staggering amount of um, containers and capsules and th that are leaving the ports of uh, Miami and, and, and Jacksonville for Haiti. And it seems like that's where the um, where, where, where the holes are. That's where the guns are coming from. At the height of the rebellion two years ago, because the conversation two years ago when I was, I stayed in Haiti for um, a big part of that 2021 rebellion. It, it was a very, very different conversation. The gangs were, were emerging. But as I, I would say, post the assassination of Jovenel Moise on July 7, 2021, so about for about two years now, the popular movement has been super suppressed. And I'm going to go through um, 
the point of view of the revolutionaries, the anti-imperialists, the socialists, the grassroots uh, leadership, particularly Molegaf. I want to put that here here in the uh, chat, and I'll show you some images. I'll share my screen uh, in a second. That's that's Molegaf. See if I spelled it correctly. And Molegaf is the All Haitian People's Movement for Equality on the Path Towards Liberation. It's, it's, if you will, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense of Haiti today, though mostly concentrated in Port-au-Prince, in the ghettos of Port-au-Prince. It doesn't have the same presence uh, in the countryside. So that's some of the work that we've been trying to do, build the militancy, build the cadre, and make it a truly national organization. The south of Haiti has very different characteristics historically because of colonialism versus the capital, Port-au-Prince, and then versus the, the North, which was really the revolutionary stronghold where Jean-Jacques Dessalines and Toussaint um, led the uh, uh, the Haitian Revolution with the slogan of coupe tete boule kai, burn down the, ha the master's house and, and, um, and, 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 and cut off the master's uh, neck. So there's, there's still that, that militancy, it's there, it's super repressed. What happened with the assassination of Jovenel Moise in the Center for uh, Economic and Policy Research put out an excellent piece about six weeks ago. They went through all the WhatsApp messages leading up to Jovenel Moise's um, assassination two years ago. Uh, you know, in, in, in Haiti, the rumors abound. Moise was by no means um, an anti-US or an anti-imperialist figure. He was the puppet of the day. Why exactly 18 Colombian mercenaries were um, hired by different security firms in the uh, Miami area, contracted by Esqualido, or anti bolivarian Venezuelans and right-wing Colombians. So you can unpack the whole thing. Uh, even the New York Times openly says that these individuals had links to the DEA, to the FBI. They had met with uh, Florida uh, police officials. So... One asks with such an abundance of evidence that the U.S. and their mercenaries from Colombia were the ones who oversaw this brutal uh, execution of the president. One would think that there would also be some U.S. officials going to jail, but uh, so far they have only targeted the Colombian mercenaries who were caught and the you know lesser fall fall guys. Exactly the motivations for Moise's assassination probably doesn't concern us too much here. Some, some was saying that he was shutting down different private runways of the uh, richest billionaires in, in Haiti, including Gilbert Bijou. Um, let me put here in the notes. So Molly Goff is the organization that I want to talk about a little bit more. And then Haiti's only billionaire, his name is Gilbert Bijou. So I want to take a second to focus on Gilbert Bougio, Bijou, and then we'll look at some uh, some slides. So, Gilbert Bijou, the only Haitian billionaire, controls um, a ton of import, export, and in, in, in properties. It's only these types of individuals who would ever have the power to move weapons privately. They have their own private ports in the Port-au-Prince area and in the Ocap area and in the other ports of, of, of Haiti. They have their own private uh, jets and landing pads. So, there were rumors, uh, they've historically been a transshipment point working with the Colombian uh, cartels. So the focus of the media is always on what the Haitians call uh, gangster avec sandal. The media looks at the poor gang bangers, the poor hustlers, the poor uh, traffickers. But they never talked about the gangster avec gravat, and that means the gangsters who have uh, ties. So all of the police violence, and this is another big debate in, in, in Haiti right now with a movement that I want to introduce to you, but because the gangs have led so many extortion rackets and everyday people can't go to work and they have to pay these uh, gangs ransom and, and, and taxes, I've been in touch with communities and I've seen it with my own eyes. Um, communities have said that the police are not the enemy. Of course, historically, the Haitian state, going back to the Tonton Makuts and 
chapter and chapter of uh, uh, U.S. foreign policy towards Haiti is, of course, used the central Haitian state. Uh, today, it's the Haitian National Police to carry out their oppression. But the societal conversation right now in Port-au-Prince is that the police is not the main enemy. The police are the ones sacrificing themselves on the front lines against these um, gangsters with, with, with sandals on. So there's often gun battles where the police are completely um, outgunned. At this point, um, my calculations, I'm confident that in Haiti is in the range of about a 1 million illegal, unaccounted for uh, guns, arms of the highest caliber, all coming from Colt and, and, and Smith and & Wesson. And these are the guns that are popping up across Port-au-Prince and across Haiti. Also, the Israeli, uh, the Zionist Galil's uh, submachine guns as well. So interesting how these, these, these merchants of death, these traffickers of, of, of death are, are, are at the heart of this crisis. I think one could almost formulate that guns plus gangs plus neocolonialism equals a genocidal reality in, in Port-au-Prince right now. Um, the numbers are staggering. Just in the first half of uh, 2023, we're in the range of 3,000 ho homicides uh, by the gangs, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kidnappings. I've seen statistics in excess of 1,000 kidnappings. Kidnappings are a new way to intimidate and demobilize the population. Um, <clears throat> they're also a way for these gangs to make money. I think the geopolitics behind the gangs, you often have, and, and this is some of the ethnographic writing that I'm doing now, you'll have a 19-year-old who's been displaced, you know, doesn't have enough money to eat lunch or, or dinner, he's hungry, he's got the clothes on his back, basically, he's wandering the streets, and he's, he's, he's prime cannon fodder um, to join one of these gangs, and all of a sudden, boom, there's a, an M16, an AK-47, in the hands of a young man that has flip-flops or maybe can't even afford flip-flops. So someone who can't afford lunch has a $2,000 on the black market. That's the average price in Haiti of one of these illegal guns. <clears throat> um, suddenly this young man has gone from a psychological type of rags to riches because he now has a certain power in his hands and he can enforce his way towards getting um, his lunch, you know, at the, at the very least. So that's kind of how the gang dynamics are playing out. It's a whole uh, hierarchy. I don't think anything in the U.S. The U.S. has very hypocritically in Canada as well. You know, Canada is the good cop always. The U.S. is bad cop. Canada, true professionals at the uh, spirit of humanitarian imperialist intervention, because right now it's the Canadians who've been spearheading it. In the past few months, the Canadians have spent... Um, more military hardware to the Haitian National Police, which is very controversial unto itself. Um, they've sent more and more uh, spy jets and military jets to Haiti, as well as, uh, as, as ships. So in some ways, the invasion hasn't accelerated, but the invasion is already there. There, there are already Canadian uh, gunboats in the, in the harbors of, uh, of Haiti. So let me shift towards the, the PowerPoint um, we're at about 12 minutes. I'll probably transition at, at the very end to give you at least some insights to the work we just did in, in Caracas. Um, you know, shout out to the Free Alex Saab uh, Coalition uh, here, here in the U.S. and internationally. They've done some amazing work. So I'll, I'll go on Haiti another 15 minutes or so, then quickly transition with just some bullet points or highlights from, uh, from Venezuela. So sharing my screen here, I think a key point to, to make is that the gangs, the overall function of the gangs is to demobilize the population. When I was in Haiti in, in, in years past, particularly 2021, this was a mass movement of millions and millions and millions of people for people's democracy against neoliberalism, against the sellout lackey, they call it Tisusu, a uh, uh, neo-colonial state. Then Jovenel Moise is killed, assassinated. And this, 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 that gives the Haitian state and their foreign backers carte blanche to shut down every movement because there was martial law and there were curfews. So these images that we're seeing here from 2021, we don't see them. Um, the movement right now is severely oppressed. There's still this and that effort 
but it's not a mass united movement because if you live in a, a community like, let's say, um, Bel Air, Bel Air is kind of the epicenter of this uh, turf war. Um, most of the, I listen to the gunshots every night. I was one community above Bel Air and you heard the, the stray bullets and stuff. And that's another thing I really, I'll come off uh, the PowerPoint for a minute. A lot of times you'll see in the Haitian mainstream media, the term stray bullet. I've been documenting um, different grassroots leaders and revolutionary leaders who've been hit with stray bullets. And the slogan is, those are not stray bullets. Those are state bullets. Those are Washington bullets, to quote Vijay Prashad. Those are neo-colonial bullets. Those are Haitian state bullets. And when they're finding the temples in, 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 in the heads of key revolutionary leaders, I mean, clearly there's nothing stray about those uh, bullets. So I do want to show you some of the leadership that's been uh, targeted. And you can see the importance um, of, of, of having hopefully more and more of, of us internationalists uh, in, in Haiti so we can document these things. You know, I really just went down there. I never thought of employing research and journalism skills when I was down there for the, the rebellion. And I just realized with the dearth of critical and anti-imperialist info coming out of Haiti, the necessity to put on that, that, that journalism hat a craft I'm continuing to to engage with. Back to the um, PowerPoint here. Um, so there's the Haitian National Police, who, <laughs> you know, in this picture is perfect. This was in 2021. We were marching through the streets, and I was taking as many pictures as I could. And you know, they don't have masks on because of COVID. They have masks on because they're hired anonymous killers. And this picture shows there's no identification on these uh, soldiers. So this is who the U.S. and Canada is constantly supplying. And if they're up against these heavily armed gang members, that's one thing. But guess who's trapped in the middle? The everyday people. But these are the very forces who shot at us and shot at me. I thought that I would get some type of pass at those demonstrations because I was trying to document everything with, you know, clearly identifiable as press and these, and they kept shooting all the tear gas, all the live ammunition. So I think that debate is is interesting. Obviously, the the U.S. is not going to send millions and more more to the Haitian police if they don't control the Haitian police. If the Haitian police don't carry out their uh, agenda, and here we have. The bald-headed party, uh, bald-headed Haitian party, the PHTK, those would be the Republicans or the Democrats. Uh, it's almost a one-party system at this point in Haiti. Uh, the, the ruling class has not allowed any election now in, in, in years. It's been years of dictatorship. The, the, the Senate has been dissolved. So there is truly a type of political anarchy that the people are trying to wade through. So that's a snapshot of the Haitian National Police. That's not who's going to free Haiti. That's what I wanted to say with that slide. A very interesting phenomena occurred uh, last month when I was there. I think it was April uh, 27th. Um, the gangs had so much hegemony. What, what the gangs do, are the, the gangs cut off every central artery of Port-au-Prince, and they charge tolls, and then if they want to, they kidnap you, sexual violence against women and children. I mean, it's it's, it's completely out of control. Uh, I've never seen in my life this level of violence in all my years going to Port-au-Prince, you know, perhaps in 2004 with the resistance to the uh, Brazilian um, Minusta UN 14-year uh, uh, occupation of Port-au-Prince and of Haiti, something that we should saw it through very closely. Um, I was in Brazil for the elections for Lula's very, very important uh, win, um, but arguably the biggest blemish on Lula's record was having uh, Brazilian ruling class generals, the very generals that uh, Bolsonaro uh, was using, oversee this occupation of Haiti uh, in which massacres were carried out in Cité Soleil, in Fort Nacional, so because of the staggering amount of violence in um, Port-au-Prince, a very organic, spontaneous thing happened um, about six Mondays ago. Some gangbangers were trying to set up from up in Petionville in the more richer communities, and they were trying to come down and set up in Canapé Ver. Because Port-au-Prince is like, 
kind of to oversimplify it, and this is all on my Twitter, any of this imagery and stuff, uh, I'll show as much as I can in this amount of time allotted, but Port-au-Prince is the 99.9% .9 of, of, of Haitians, of, of African peoples, descendants of Africans in Port-au-Prince, in Cité Soleil, in the everyday ghettos that if you're a Haiti watcher, you've heard of. And then you go up this huge, long, winding, um, I, you can't really call it a, 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 a highway, but it's, it's like a type of highway. And that's and once you've gone up there for an hour or so, and you're so far away from the real Port-au-Prince, that's when you're in Petionville. That's where the cabinet ministers and the in in the Bijos and the in the Boulos and all the ruling class Haitians live, who who whose skin is about as uh, fair as is mine. Their roots go back to the uh, mulatto um, slash French division with the uh, African abducted slaves. So this is the, it's not the 1%, it's the 0.01%. I'll try to show some, uh, some, some images. So there's really two Hades, the Haiti of the 99.9% .9 and then the other Haiti. And when you go up through there, there's more private security than public security. Right now in Haiti, there's 9,000 police officers officially. Right now in Haiti, there are three, according to the Haitian state, three Coast Guard boats, only one functions. The coastline of Haiti is about 1,500 miles. So one riggedy raggedy old Coast Guard ship in Haiti, which may or may not be functioning, is in charge of keeping the Colombian gun runners and the Haitian American gun runners. And they just caught an anti-Cuban uh, Miami, uh, you know, Cuban descendancy, but I don't think he deserves the title <laughs> of being a true Cuban, you know, Cubano Americano, Gusano, whatever term you all feel comfortable with. That was one of the biggest cases in the past. That was the most recent case. Cuban American gun runner from Miami bringing hundreds of weapons over the Dominican uh, border. There's not time right now. I, I, I'll, put, I'll, put, I'll put out one minute on this, but whenever the crisis flares up in, in, in Haiti, Haitians are forced to go to the closest uh, place possible to flee the war and, and to flee the economic uh, chaos. Um, and what's the closest place? It's the Dominican Republic. So you have these two peoples, two nations, two language groups, two cultures, two histories, two beautiful people um, sharing this island. I mean, imagine if the US and Mexico were sharing an island in, in, in all of the same imperialist dynamics existed and the Mexicans were trying to cross that tiny border on that island. Well, that's a snapshot of, I've done a lot of work on that border. And that's a border between Haiti and DR. That Dominican side is a border of xenophobia, white supremacy, humiliation, and Haitian death. And that's something that I've been documenting a lot to the chagrin of the Dominican ruling class who have continually uh, labeled me an enemy because I've, bared to, I, I've dared to talk about the truth of what goes on at that border. Um, the economic crisis in, in, in Haiti, um, gasoline for one gallon peaked last year at 25 US dollars. I'm gonna talk in dollars because the Haitian good would mean nothing to anyone except the, you know, the Haitian people. You wouldn't probably be able to do the conversions, but, a sweatshop worker right now, uh, th th there's a fight to increase the minimum wage. These are ongoing fights. So there's still, there's still our social movements. They're just more encachet. They're just more clandestine. It's not as easy to have a critical mass in the, in the streets because then the gangs can just start, start shooting, pick off whoever they want. And they go, oh, those are stray bullets. And it's, it's been very tough to document these assassination campaigns. Uh, right now, when I was just there, gasoline was at $15 per gallon. Um, I mean, an average worker in Haiti in the formal sector, if they're lucky enough to somehow get into a sweatshop. And, 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 and it's probably important to say this has been the historical model. War on the peasantry, war on the land, using U.S. aid, um, dumping the, the rice from Arkansas. That's why the Clintons are especially well hated down here. Something else we can expand upon and, 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 and document um, the flooding of the markets. They, 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 they call these uh, cheap donations that they don't want in Haitian Creole. They call them Kennedys after John F. Kennedy because it's such a history of the U.S. dumping all of their charity and trash on, on top of Haiti. This undermines local textile production. This undermines local rice production and sugar production. So 
the Haitian land is not doing what it's capable of, despite five centuries of brutal uh, French colonialism. So a big part of this whole discussion is, is reparations. Um, definitely that's somewhere in, in, in every article that I write, we always want to end on a, on a high note, on a hope, a hope of Haitian resistance and Haitian hope and revolutionary optimism. And I'll just throw that out there now before I go back to, to Bois Calais. Reparations is something that always has to be in every conversation. Jean Bertrand Aristide, the democratically elected president in 1991 and again in 2001, he demanded $21 billion just from the French empire in terms of the damage that was done to the Haitian people over the course of uh, centuries. Aristide had a 21 gun salute when he took state power in 2001. I don't have to tell you all how long it took the U.S. the U.S. Marines to abduct him and deposit him in the Central African Republic for the second time. Jean Bertrand Aristide was kidnapped on Netflix or um, YouTube. Perhaps you can watch Aristide: The Endless Revolution, which documents uh, the the Lavalas movement. The Lava. A lot of people ask me about the Lavalas movement. They're definitely still there. I don't think they have the same presence as they had with the Tile Eglise, the People's Liberation Theology Church in the in the 80s and 90s, which culminated in this really world-inspiring Aristide uh, victory coming out of those Duvalier, you know, almost four decades of just the most rampant, horrific oppression through the Tonton Makuts. Haiti did the impossible with Jean Bertrand Aristide. I mean, that was the moment. The Deschoucage, the uprooting of Duvalierism in 1986, built the popular groundswell for Aristide to win in 91. But every time in Haitian history, there's been a moment where Haiti can pivot towards true allies. And this is another one of the big, big solutions the Haitian people always talk about. Our future is not through Miami. Our future is not through D.C., our future is not through the neo-colonial metropoles of, of Montreal and Paris. Our future is through Caracas. Our future is with Lima. Our future is with Havana and, 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 and the other toiling peoples of the uh, uh, region. So I think that's something super important to remember because the vast majority of Haitian immigrants, and there's a huge migration crisis right now, of course they want to go to the U.S. because the U.S. dollar is worth 155 Haitian goods. And when they've devalued your currency so thoroughly, the Dominican pesos at 54 pesos for one US dollar. So for Haitian to go to DR is definitely a, a step up on, on, on the rungs of Dante's neo-colonial inferno. But to get to the US, to even dream about it for many Haitians, in material terms, it's it's you know it's it's their only hope. It's the only way to feed themselves and their and their family. So, the Haitian comrades have said it's very difficult to organize uh, our people when our people's sights are set on migration on Miami because they haven't been afforded a way to live in their in their homeland. So, back to Bois Calais. I'm at uh, 27 minutes. So, Bois Calais. So the people get so sick of the gangs and the ransom and the police are outgunned or the police aren't present. Some say the police are also part of this and that the police train the people. So the people arm themselves uh, first with machetes because they couldn't access uh, guns. Or, or here you have like, I think that's uh, in this image, it's like a makeshift uh, ho homemade gun. And the people said, we're going after these gangsters. So on April 27th, they got a hold of uh, 13 gang members stone them to death burn them to death drag them through the streets as trophies as if to say you know any gang that tries to come into here we got bois calais bois calais is is basically it's an idiomatic expression it, it be, it's a curse word that i'm not going to translate yeah, everyone can use their imagination um but we'll just translate it as a, a people self-organized vigilante brigades to protect their, their neighborhoods. So these are the people arming, them, arming themselves. There's been images that have surfaced of um, 100,000 machetes being passed out in the most oppressed communities. So I wanted you to have an appreciation for this, this sociological moment because the people feel more emboldened, like they've been able to um, keep the gangs somewhat at bay. But I think it's gonna be uh, ongoing. Ariel Henry is the third iteration 
of the PHTK, the uh, ruling class bald headed party. I mean, what an unprofessional, goofy name for a political party, the all Haitian bald headed party. It gives you a sense. These, these are not serious people. These are not true politicians that are trained. These are gangsters and jokers. I don't know if you all remember Michel Martelly. He was the president before Moise. Michelle Martelly, it was uh, Hillary Clinton that flew there in 2011 to break a political deadlock and to be night Michelle Martelly and to say, you're the next, you know, Haitian president. So it was definitely coming directly from the, the U.S. with direct intervention. I call Michelle Martelly the Andrew Dice Clay of, of Haiti because he was, he was a vulgar entertainer, musician, always on stage with the most vulgar profanity. And then the next day he's president of the country. It's mind boggling. It's it's absolutely mind-boggling. I'm sure there's different parallels across the the world. A Ronald Reagan-esque, you know, figure from actor to governor of California, that that type of thing. Um, let me see what other slides I have here. And then whatever I miss, I miss, of course, I can address. Um here you have the US Embassy, always super well guarded. So many of the demonstrations. And the political anger is, of course, directed at the U.S. Embassy, the French Embassy, the Canadian Embassy. So that's another role of the Haitian National Police functioning as um, as as U.S. Uh, uh, mercenaries. Um, I, I shouted out here Pompeo and Rubio and Almagro and these other characters as as the real culprits for everything going on in 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 Haiti. The organization of American states is severely crippled with the second iteration of the left-wing pink tide across Latin America, but the OAS is still trying to lead the charge to re-occupy um, Haiti. And the hypocrisy of like a Marco Rubio talking about, we need uh, internet for the, you know, the poor Cuban people, well, poor Cuban people blockaded by who? None other than you and your Republican party and the Democratic party for 64 years now. Um, but I think, these very people advocating for quote unquote this and that in, in Cuba don't even ever touch Haiti where things like internet and electricity are just very, very difficult to even even access or come by. So here we have um Patizanyo. That's the word that comes from the partisans. It would be the Haitian Creole equivalent. Here are the leaders. This is the face of resistance. This is who trained me the past uh, few years. Um, well, in 2014 is when I got close to Molegaf. Here on our left, or at least my left, that's T Marxist. They call him young, a little Marxist. Um, if you look closely, he lost one of his arms because of police violence at a demonstration. But uh, as his sign indicates, he's stronger than ever. Uh, I don't think you have to know fluent Haitian Creole to know that Maliga says, down with imperialism, long live communism. Here we have Ricardo Boucher on my right, one of my closest comrades. This is one of the national poets of, of, of Haiti. Um, we made those, I remember making those, those signs. So it's the small little donations that we can get together. I'm actually gonna put a people to people fundraiser uh, in the chat. So people can check out more about Molegaf. I'll put my um, Twitter again. And um, this is just a sense of some of the mobilizing that uh, the camaradio, the comrades do down there. This is a documentary list uh, that I put together for those interested in diving in deeper to Haitian history. Um, just to give one example, Mickey Mouse goes to Haiti I don't know if you all remember the National Labor Committee, but they were going around the exploited countries and they were documenting Walt Disney World and, and Kathy Lee Gifford and Banana Republic and Old Navy, where are they producing their clothes? And I touched upon it earlier with the displacement of the Haitian peasantry, it pushes them into the shanty towns, into the bidon villes, that's ghettos in, in, in French of, of Port-au-Prince, they're, they're swelling bidon villes. And what jobs are available? The sweatshop jobs. So that's been the historical neo-colonial model to entrap Haitians, no different from the 1915 to 1934 U.S. military occupation where they implemented the corvée system. The corvée system, they basically re-implemented uh, slavery and chained Haitians to build all these roads for Haskell, the Haitian American sugar company. So I always challenge anyone 
you know, in a debate who's coming from a different pro-U.S. angle, identify one moment when Haiti has truly been free since 1804, since its revolution, from uh, neo-colonial uh, dastardly influences. So I think any analysis of Haiti, the starting point has to be of Haiti as a neo-colony. What does that mean economically? What does that mean culturally? Of course, voodoo, the voodoo religion, um, this is a beautiful thing. This is a way of life. I mean, Haiti is voodoo. Everything in Haiti is voodoo. And that's why Hollywood and white supremacy would target voodoo and the voodoo dolls and the serpent and the rainbow and all of the usual racist rhetoric because they're never going to honor uh, Black people's spirituality. To quote John Henrik Clark, when colonialism takes away your spirituality, they have already taken away everything. So the spiritual struggle in Haiti is alive and well. Uh, before every demonstration, uh, voodoo is, is, is present. What does that mean? There's different symbols that they draw in chalk. There's different fires. Um, really a beautiful, beautiful religion that I've been around since 1998. Um, there's a fair amount of uh, sugarcane uh, rum, homemade rum involved in some of these ceremonies. <laughs> but, you know, the way that they vilify it in, in, in Hollywood just shows their uh, their their racism. So I'll leave it there for um, for Haiti and we can come back to Haiti and the questions and, and, and answer anything that I've left out about the gangs and the guns and the potential while well, really ongoing occupation, even if it's not boots on the ground uh, right now, it could be that uh, any day. So I'll pivot towards Alex Saab and Venezuela for the next uh, five to 10 minutes for the, so, and then we'll be right at 40 to 45 minutes that I've been uh, speaking. So, you know, I've been very privileged to go to uh, Venezuela, to Caracas, I think every year, once or twice since about 2014. So I've really been able to follow the Nicolas Maduro years, the challenges. Um, Venezuela is emerging from the economic war. Things are very, very, very difficult, but it's not 2015, 16, 17, when Venezuelans like Cubans in the 1990s were losing 10, 20 pounds uh, of body mass over the course of months and months and months. I mean, that's how terrible the crisis was when the 2014 Obama sanctions kicked in and Venezuela's entire oil industry was, was paralyzed. You had the internal fifth columns of the right wing who still had their hand in the, in the oil industry. So the Venezuelans really have, have overcome so much in such a humble, anonymous way. Uh, 7.5 Venezuelans since 2014, 7.5 million have been forced to leave their homeland. Um, of course, the U.S. mainstream media has a field day with this, and CNN could go and say, look at the poor Venezuelans fleeing the dictatorship, the same thing they've been saying about Cuba for how long. This is their tried and true tactics of uh, propaganda. But the truth is that these are refugees of a criminal blockade. As we see multipolarity rise up everywhere, I mean, who could have thought five years ago that Syria would again be within the Arab League? Who thought that Iran and Saudi Arabia could sit down, brokered by the Chinese? Who thought that dozens and dozens of countries, I, I heard the other day that like every Middle Eastern country is knocking on the door to, to, to join BRICS, including the, Sa the Saudis. So we are, I always tell my students, you're living through history. Don't just be a witness to history, be a participant in history, because we're witnessing the definitive burial and, and failure of the U.S. unipolar uh, post-Soviet collapse model. And I think that's where Venezuela and Nicaragua and, and, and Cuba and, and Haiti in a different type of way can begin to feel some type of uh, relief. So we were there at the same time that the Iranian president was doing his tour. I mean, that's a powerful thing the the, the, the U.S. Um, Navy and Coast Guard have kidnapped so many Iranian vessels and then stolen those vessels, stolen all of that oil. Uh, the Iranians, of course, this deserves a deeper internal look at, at the at the different forces and the contradictions of the Islamic revolution. But uh, Iran has played a key role uh, in supporting these different South American countries that, uh, well, one, one third of the world uh, li lives under sanctions. So it's continued to be very cruel to the Venezuelan people. The, the Bolivar has by no means recovered. 
but it's no longer, you know, 4 million bolivares for one US dollar. Now it's 28 or 29, but that still means that the average Venezuela worker is, is probably making 100 bucks a, a, a month. So it's a monetary war. It's a war on people's self-esteem. And, and those who have stayed and fought that Chavista base, I think, is very, very, very strong. And that's what brought us to Caracas last week. You know, I got back uh, on Monday um, in this quest to free the diplomat Alex Saab, because imagine the arrogance of the U.S. They get to pick and choose which diplomats can travel the world freely, peddling, you know, neoliberalism and, and peddling the profits out of these different countries. But when the Venezuelans want to have their own people's representatives and diplomats and embajadores, ambassadors, they can be uh, picked off in Cape Verde um, in, in, in kidnapped. It's three years that uh, Alex Saab hasn't seen. Uh, we, we were with his family, with Camila, Fabri, De Saab, and, and his children. And, you know, they're really, really hurting. So we had an entire uh, conference for a week against lawfare, um, incredible anti-imperialist uh, representation from across South America, from across Africa, from across, I think, I've I've long been calling Caracas the Algiers of 2023. If you all remember, in 1971, a big part of the Black Panthers was set up in uh, in Algiers, and you had the Algerian Revolution, and you had revolutionaries of all ilks passing through Algiers. Every time I'm in Caracas, we don't sleep because why would you want to sleep when next door to you is the Tunisian Communist delegation, and the next door down it's the it's the South Africans who are the rep representatives to the BRICS. So it's just like. It's almost like overload whenever you're in Caracas because you're meeting uh, so many different anti-imperialists from around the world whose work we can we can draw from. You know, it's a truly uh, beautiful thing. I think um, Venezuela continues to do the impossible. They have uh, truly people's media at the state level, at the national level, at the local level, and of course, Telesur at the international level. Um, 2005 is when Telesur was launched under the slogan of uh, Nuestro Norte Será el Sur. Our northern horizon will be the South, building South to South relations. We don't need CNN. We can create our own people's CNN and, and, and networks. And to see that still there is very inspiring. And right across the street from Telesur, and Telesur has an enormous you know, skyscraper of a building, right across the street is the intelligence unit of the Bolivarian military because they understand that the right wing sponsored by the U.S. will do everything to target the um, central means of communication of the Bolivarian revolution. So, so much respect to Telesur and then uh, VTV, and I can go through all the different uh, networks, the radio of the South, and anyone who's been to Venezuela, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing to see the Chavista bases. Uh, it's really David versus Goliath. and um, more and more work that we we do, you know, more Venezuelans want to help Haiti and more Haitians want to support the Venezuelan Bolivarian Revolution. And the MST from Brazil has historically sent um, internationalist volunteers to go to Haiti and, and, and support truly self-sustaining agricultural projects. And we do a lot of work, Paulo Freire-esque people's education work in Haiti. And that's something that truly amazes me. Um, with a whole war around you to see 18 year olds, you know, studying Marx and, and studying Malcolm X and studying the Haitian Revolution with books that the covers have long been ripped off from the Duvalier times because they if you get if you got caught one of those books, it was an automatic torture and, and death sentence in, in Fort Dimash. So the Haitians continue to fight back. The Venezuelans continue to give us uh, an amazing example I think the world around us is 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 taking a new multipolar form, and it could not come soon enough for the blockaded peoples of the world. Uh, some blockaded directly by U.S. hybrid wars, others blockaded by how many years of neo-colonialism. So the Haitian fate is surely, surely intertwined with their uh, neighbors in the West Indies and, and, and across the uh, hemispheres. We continue to find, uh, search for different opportunities to try to get visas so the Haitian comrades can go to Brazil and participate in, in Nicaragua and in, in different conferences, because that's really, I think, one of our main roles from the Imperial Center. How can we help, you know, support 
in different creative and material ways the the Haitian resistance. So I'll leave it there at uh, 43 uh, minutes and change, and we'll see what we get in the in the back, back and forth. Thank you for this space. Thank you, Professor Danny Shaw. That was a terrific pre presentation. There'll be a lot of Q and A questions, but before we jump into the Q and A, I would like to announce what our upcoming programs are. Next weekend is the 4th of July weekend. Uh, needless to say, the uh, program committee of um, the um, Marxist Library, the I ICSS, the, um, we are not exactly excited about celebrating 4th of July, but we have taken, we we've decided to take a break um, because a lot of people have family um, involvement that weekend. So we're not going to have a program next Sunday. But two Sundays from now, I'm going to ask you to join with us. And Alan Miller, if you who's also on the program committee, if you could tell us about the upcoming programs that we currently have scheduled. Sure. On uh, Sunday, July 9th, 10.30 usual time, Pacific time, we have a program, U.S. Imperial Policy in Korea. Our speaker will be Simone Chun, who is a... Uh, an activist, a member of uh, active in the Korea Policy Institute, uh, basically giving us an update of what's going on in Korea. Lots happening um, and uh, a lot of interest in, in the issue. Uh, then on uh, Sunday, July 23rd, again at 1030, we have Beta Brada Payne on the farm crisis in the US and India. Beta Brada spoke, um, I guess it was a little bit probably a year or two ago, on a film that he made, a fascinating documentary on uh, U.S., where he traveled with his film crew through the Midwestern United States, interviewing U.S. farmers who were becoming um, disenfranchised, thrown off the land, and, and under tremendous pressure uh, financially because of U.S. agricultural policy. Uh, basically linking it to what's going on in India with the disappropriation and the farmers movement in India. So um, we it's going to be a good program on July 23rd. And we have other programs. Uh, if you go to our website at icssmarks.org, you can sign up. There'll be a pop-up that a pop-up uh, box that allows you to put your name and your email in. You'll receive regular email notifications for programs. There's also uh, links to past programs and um, ways of contacting us through the contact form and also um, ways of viewing, pa um, I'm sorry, uh, con uh, financial contributions. So uh, go to the website and we look forward to seeing you guys. Thanks. Well, July sixteenth, uh, uh, Alan I, and Roger. I just want to say July sixteenth. We hope to get Norman Finkelstein in, but it's not confirmed. So you hadn't mentioned July sixteenth, but it's not confirmed. Just just wanted to let people know we still hope to get Norman Finkelstein to come back and speak. Very good. Well, th thank you, Raj, and thank you, Alan. Um, and now we'll go into the Q&A. Um, we ask you to um, limit your questions or comments for about two minutes. Um, Alan will time you and then give uh, Danny a chance to respond. So I see Richard Wright has a question. So Richard, please take it away. You mute, mute yourself. Um, Alan, can everybody mute themselves? Uh, unmute. Um, Richard, you're, you're you're still muted. Uh, if you could unmute yourself. Richard, you should be able to unmute. Ah, there we go. Okay. Oh, Technology. <laughs> uh, 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 thank you for this presentation on Haiti. I just had a, a very quick um, uh, question. Um, and, and that is, um, 
Um, Haiti is in in sort of a uh, uh, the nexus of of international. Um, um, there's a lot of international stuff, especially um, the Monroe Doctrine, for example, uh, as applied to the Caribbean. Um, I guess my question is is really to sum it up real quickly: is this? Um, are there any indications of the Chinese or the Russians' uh, uh, economic involvement in either Haiti or the Dominican Republic? Um, and, you know, if, and if you uh, address that, I appreciate it. Thank you. And Roger, do you prefer for me to hear five different comments, questions, and then respond? Yo, our 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 kind of format is to make it interactive. So, okay, okay. Um, it, we'll do one question at a time. Thank you. Great, great. So, um, and I'm seeing here uh, Gary's books. Oh my, I might have to take a road trip from the Bronx to. Uh, I know a lot about Gary's books, so. Judy Ann's uh, <laughs> a comment in the chat that got me slightly uh, distracted. It is indeed one heck of an impressive revolutionary book collection. Um, <clears throat> I often do a tour of the Dominican media, the Dominican ruling class media uh, when I exit Haiti. And one of the first things the Dominican media, which is a very anti-Haitian media, it's a ruling class media, so no surprises, but um, they always uh, ask me about the Russians in 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 Haiti and uh, Russians in Haiti. I'm trying to think of an interesting historical analogy. I mean, there's there are no Russians in in Haiti. Um, what I can say is on several occasions, uh, different organizations that I've worked with marched through the streets and made some Russian flags and brought out some Russian flags. Why would they do that? That wasn't a sign of any Russian um, presence. That wasn't a sign of any Russian presence in the region. They were hoisting up the Russian flags as a middle finger to the US and urging the Russians to veto any US in French and Canadian plans to reinvade and reoccupy uh, Haiti. But economically, certainly as the BRICS grow, as the multipolar world grows, uh, Chinese capital in Haiti, I mean, it's, you know, I, I one title of a book for the Dominican Republic in, in Haiti that's come up for me is like the last U.S. neocolony because um, it's not like Brazil or Uruguay or... or or, or, or Ecuador, where it's diversified the trading partners, it's still completely dominated by the US. The other um, propaganda they always throw out there, they'll always ask me on Dominican TV, well, what about the 18 mesquitas? Mesquitas is the word they use for mosques. And supposedly there's these 18 dangerous mosques um, spread throughout Haiti. I mean, I've met on an individual basis, you know, this or that Haitian Muslim inspired in similar ways, perhaps like, you know, Malcolm X was to 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 embrace Islam, but I've never seen a Muslim presence in, in Haiti. But they use these types of things to distract from who the real colonizer are, neo-colonizers are. And for me on Dominican TV, I'm like, it's funny how you're worried about 18 mystical I don't even think they exist, you know, mosques. Well, what about the thousands and thousands and thousands of religious mercenaries, AKA missionaries, the Mormons and the saints, the Latter-day Saints who've brought every last iteration of, of, of their religion, of a white religion, of a Western religion, however you wanna, aren't they invaders? And no one ever asks about them. So even within these questions, um, uh, in, in the Dominican media, there's such a built-in uh, bias, but certainly the Haitian grassroots leadership wants to have those economic links. How can we send more of the Haitian leadership to, to Beijing and to Caracas and to Moscow so that those types of possibilities exist? Because who's going to rule Haiti? Right now, it's just warring, corrupt, ruling class factions um, and, and that's that's most likely who killed Jovenel Moise. Some some other jealous, 
you know, want to be president. There's a joke in Haiti that everyone wants to be president. And it is a joke, but when we have like different meetings, when meeting new people in the diaspora, often someone shows up in like a suit and they try to like, from the beginning of these meetings, position themselves as like, well, if we do actually win, you know, that's the next president. So there's a lot of internalized, you know, neo-colonial ideas, you know, before we can have people's general, we need a whole lot of people's soldiers. So that's the metaphor that they use to combat that kind of um, hunger for, for, for power. So hopefully that begins to address Richard's uh, question. Thank you. The next question is from Youssef Gerzi and followed by Eugene Rule. Youssef, please. Yeah, I, um, you commented on the uh, president who was assassinated by uh, uh, it, what seemed to be foreign mercenaries um, uh, or agents. Uh, I'm not too surprised about that. Uh, I think it's because he was a, li a liability and I draw a parallel uh, between um, uh, that and the assassination of GM by CIA. Uh, it was just a liability that uh, uh, let the situation go out of hand and uh, was inviting a, a, a uh, uh, a revolutionary backlash, uh, so uh, they uh, decide. Uh, so you know the U.S. and whatever decide to uh, uh, do away with him. Uh, would you agree with that analysis? <clears throat> yeah, uh, sometimes in in Haiti, there's so many different rumors that you have to sort through. Um, what I can say is this: I have conversed with and interviewed and had dinner with and marched with thousands and thousands and thousands of Haitians. And in 2021, um, they understood that this was the main figurehead um, of US neo-colonial rule. And they had to oust Jovenel Moise or Neg Manan because he came up in the banana export. He, he was a banana exporter, again, with no, no political background whatsoever, artificially hoisted to the summits of the nation. I don't know, it's, it's laughable when you actually peel back the layers of, of corruption. Um, but I never heard one Haitian leader or the masses articulate any personalized hatred or desire to hurt Jovenel Moïse. So when he was assassinated in a very unpredictable way, it was at the height of this movement to oust him, but to oust him in a popular way. This was done behind the Haitians' backs. I don't think a lot of Haitians cried when they woke up in Jovenel Moise. I was actually on the second to last flight out of Haiti when he was killed. Um, Haitians were not celebrating in any way. I don't think they were crying. But I think they felt like, here we go again, further proof that our destiny is not in our hands. We couldn't take him out the way we needed to take him out. How come these dark foreign powers, all the palace intrigue, you know, and, and what these 18 Colombians yelled in English when they surrounded the um, the palace was the, the presidential quarters. They yelled, um, DEA, drop your weapons. So the entire Haitian presidential security detail sees light-skinned people, you know, Colombians, right? And the psychological neo-colonial reflex was, oh, it's the DEA, we got to believe them. And they all, the, the, the entire presidential guard, they didn't get shot, none of them, because they threw down their weapons and were belly down as the president, not the president, but the usurper, the usurping dictator. I, I feel no solidarity with him, but I feel solidarity with, with human life. So that's one way to understand that. They said, you know, there were rumors. I didn't see credible sources of evidence, but there were rumors that he was trying to pivot towards the Russians to make some deals with the Russians. The, um, the other rumors were that he was pissing off different factions of that infighting. Um, the, the, the Haitian oligarchs, the vast majority are descendants of the French, of the mulattoes. And then you have a lot of Syrian and Lebanese Arab businessmen and traders who came in in the late 1800s. So it's a very light-skinned oligarchical class. I mean, it's like El Salvador. It's like 12 families who control the, the, the entire you know nation. So if he pissed off some of those families and they didn't feel he was reliable, 
Because again, the private security forces of just one of these families is larger than like the entire police detail down in Port-au-Prince. So the true warlords, the true people in control of Haiti's destiny, the true usurpers are the Boulos and the Bijos, these, these, the, the, the Apeds, the sweatshop owners. They're the ones that have all the power. And these different politicians are a dime a dozen. So if, if maybe they maybe they pre-calculated, we can clear this guy out. It'll give us carte blanche to see no more, you know, of these. They would have they they would frame it as these freaking malere, these poor people flooding the streets. We can't go about business as usual. So I, I think Youssef, you said it best. They got rid of DM at a certain moment. They got rid of Trujillo at a certain moment. And so Walter Rodney said that colonialism is a one-armed bandit and that one-armed bandit takes from the colony and then imposes on the colony. So that's, that's, that's my um, understanding. There were other rumors that he had interfered with some of the Colombian and Haitian American secret landing strips where they were smuggling in all of the guns and the drugs don't, historically the drugs haven't stayed in Haiti, but they've gone through. There was um, Jean-Claude Paul, who was one of Duvalier's main lieutenants, and he got caught up, and he actually got caught, went to jail, Guy Philippe as well, for the trafficking of all this uh, cocaine. But there's no market for cocaine within within Haiti. It, it's on its way to the U.S. from Colombia, usually. Okay, th thank you. Next on the stack is Gene Rule, followed by Raj Sahai, and then I'll put myself on the stack. So, Gene, please. And, and unmute yourself. Okay, I'm unmuted. Yeah, well, thanks so much, Danny, for this 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 talk and also for the activism you brought there. It's really in the best tradition, I think, of, of Marxism. So th thanks thanks for this. Uh, but but I, what I'd like to do is add a historical perspective to all this because all this is not new. And the very first foreign aid of the United States government was to the was when Thomas Jefferson sent money to the slave owners of Haiti to maintain their revolution. And in various ways since then, uh, the United States, as you point out, the United States' role there, you know, has been a, 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 you know, an imperialistic one. And uh, I just also note that I believe, um, you know, after the Haitian Revolution, France forced the Haitians to pay reparations to them because they lost their property, you know, with this freeing of the slaves. And, you know, I believe our 14th Amendment in the United States, it explicitly says that slave owner, American slave owners in the South could not sue the government because they lost their property. You know, there were to be no reparations. And I think that's, you know, something about that. And the other thing I note is that, you know, Marx never talked, I don't believe, about the Haitian Revolution. I mean, this is a very important event in world history, but it's not mentioned, I believe, at all by Marx. And I think we Marxists tend to um, neglect the role that Haiti has played in, you know, its own revolution, but in furthering revolution throughout Latin America and the, and the world. So if you'd like to comment on that, uh, I'd be interested in what you want to say on that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Eugene. Of course, you're 100% correct. I posted here um, at 2.22, so a few minutes ago, more information on Molegaf, on one of the leading organizations of resistance. You can imagine <laughs> they denounced the, the NGO model. And of course, ideologically, it's great to denounce the NGO model, as we all do. Problem is, you then broke at the end of the day. So, uh, how do we get material resources to Haiti? That's been a major, major challenge because you can't run a school without books and pens and no pet. We just need the most basics of the basics. Most of the leading comrades who we try to get into international media to make appearances, then if, if they don't have a smartphone, if they don't have internet, so David versus uh, uh, Goliath. And as as Eugene lays out, and Goliath has historically been. U.S. Um, invading underneath the people, the 
people fundraiser, I put um, my latest article for Truth Out, and I go through chapter and chapter after chapter of U.S. Um, interventionism. And, you know, it's a symbolic year this year, 200 years of, uh, of, of Monroeism. Um, look what they're doing right now in Peru. I'm working closely with the Peruvian comrades uh, back in Peru because now there's 1,000 uh, U.S. soldiers who've, who've entered into Peru. I mean, it's mind-boggling, and no one's even reporting on it, on the U.S. They just have, so this manifest destiny, Monroe Doctrine, <clears throat> gunboat diplomacy, it's really useful to ask, you know, has, has anything changed? So as they, law, as they lose ground, um eh, around the world certainly the the latin american left is at a strong point right now i think we have a fortified mexico you know when's the last time the u.s had to deal with a, a nationalist mexico with with a, a, a lopez obrador a mexican president who was willing to stand with cuba and, and Nicolas Maduro, and Nicolas Maduro was invited two weeks ago to Turkey, and then to Saudi Arabia, and he was in Brasilia. So things are really, really, really uh, changing. I feel like the oppressed peoples of the world are truly finding one another, and it couldn't come soon enough for the Haitians, because I don't think we can imagine true liberation for Haiti um, as long as they're a U.S. neocolony. We're going to continue to see what we're seeing. The sociological ways that this iterate, that this manifest may vary, but you know, we're going to continue to see mass migration, mass death as, as, as Haitians take to the seas again. It was what was called the boat people crisis in the 1980s, when basically the Statue of Liberty, the Statue of Liberty told the Cubans, you know, come on, come on, let's make the revolution look bad. And they told the Haitians, right, you know, stop right there. So the hypocrisy of U.S. immigration policy has been on full display the uh, the whole time. At the same time, you know, in a lot of let me actually show a few images here before we um, wrap up. I wanted to show you um, some of the actual work that we're doing over there. This is um, Dominique Racing. This is a message in a lot of what I was doing was translating. I'll just play a second of it. So this is an interesting leader. This is Domini, and he's speaking directly to th this. This was the morning. This was 9 a.m. in the morning when the U.N. was meeting on April 27th. So he spoke in his language. I translated to English and Spanish just to get the uh, word out. If you want a deeper dive into Haiti, go on my Twitter through April and May and you'll see all these different things. So this is what the um, this meeting here, I think, was with a union of uh, fishermen. <laughs> so he's saying to the Haitian fishermen's organization, um, these young gangsters aren't really our enemy. They're just the lumpen proletariat. They're trying to survive. So, yeah, I mean, all of their work over there is is against another U.S. Uh, takeover of their country. Thank, thank you, Danny. So Raj and I had put myself on the stack, but I'll bump myself for Janet after Raj. So Raj, take it away, please. Okay, thank you. Danny, I uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, the uh, question I have, actually, you observed about multipolarity visit of Iranian president to Haiti and to Venezuela, if I didn't misunderstand you. And and this effort, uh, uh, this this uh, stranglehold the U.S. has on Haiti. I mean, Haiti he, he had an anti-imperialist rebellion against France. I don't know how many years ago. It was a couple hundred years or something. Uh, so those who have argued the two imperialist thesis on Ukraine, how blind are they? They don't see what has happened in the uh, hemisphere, uh, in this Western hemisphere, I mean, American two continents, and they claim now that somehow there are two imperialism. And it is shocking that a party, Greek Communist Party, 
uh, is is sort of uh, spearheading this what I call left wing communist line. And but you know the remarkable thing is in Cuba they did overthrow imperialism, and they have paid a huge price. Uh, Haitians paid a huge price here, but multipolarity. Therefore, I conclude from your talk is a good thing for national liberation of oppressed peoples. Whereas a lot of people in the communist left in the United States are arguing that is nothing more than uh, another set of imperialists uh, taking power. And so I would like you to kind of uh, uh, respond to that kind of criticism that comes from there. You have mentioned something, but if you want to elaborate on it, I'd like to hear that. One other thing is a question. Seven and a half million Haitians leaving Haiti shows enormous, I mean, Haitian population, I don't know what it is, I didn't look up, but it couldn't be a uh, hundred times of that. So ha Haitian population is probably uh, less than 25 million, I would guess. So that's a but, huge population. Anyway, uh, those are the questions and comments. And if you could elaborate further on this mm -hmm. multipolarity, how it affects Haiti a little bit further. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Raj. Um, <clears throat> Haiti has 2.7 million people in Port-au-Prince, 11.5 million people in the entire country, and another 2.5 million Haitians in the diaspora. That diaspora grew. Um, I was actually with a buddy last night who's Haitian, and he lived in Chile for like eight years after the earthquake. So you had a massive influx of Brazilians into Chile, into Brazil. Yeah, the Bolsheviks, uh, Lenin himself, uh, they wrote uh, in depth about this uh, question that uh, uh, besieged workers had every right to trade with whoever they had to uh, trade with. I guess the Breslitov uh, tree, Breslitov tree, one um, trying to maintain peace with a well, with the Nazis who ultimately killed 27, you know, million Soviets. So <clears throat> to the extent that a Venezuela have a new market and a new relationship with an Iran, none of us here have any illusions, <laughs> here elements. We have to go back to the 1979 Islamic Revolution and look through all the different layers um, the leftists were very involved and they were also very uh, persecuted. So <clears throat> Venezuela has the right to trade with any state that can afford them any relief from this campaign of hunger and starvation masterminded in, in Washington. So if, if you look at Telesur, I mean, all these contradictions are always going to manifest itself. We have to be dialecticians to the, to the fullest. The, Venezuelans in, in their media have never critiqued Erdogan in the, in, in the Turkish uh, government, not because they have any type of ideological affinity, but Turkey is a major player within the European Union with major resources. And if they can have a working relationship to circumvent the effect of what Brussels and Paris and in London, I mean, there's, there's billions of dollars of Venezuelan gold uh, stolen in, in, in the vaults of uh, London. So I think the Bolivarian leadership, they've been doing a very uh, good job. Um, we have elections coming up in Argentina. Things are not looking the best in Argentina. There's a massive campaign of repression um, right now in uh, Hujoy, in the most um, northernmost uh, indigenous provinces of, of, of Argentina. Elections in October, you know, very, very exciting. Um, Uruguay is in the middle of a, of a national uh, uh, strike by the unions. Paraguay just had a Stroessner-esque, dictator-esque individual win a few months ago. Uh, not, not, not good. So, so the, the class struggle is going to continue to play out with all of its contradictions across South America. And look at the Ecuadorians. The Ecuadorians had a major defeat of Andres Sarraus, the Correista candidate, and Guillermo Lasso did such a horrible job. The Pandora Papers exposed all of the um, corruption. And now in August, 
They have to redo elections where it looks like Luis Gonzalez, the Correista candidate, is a very, 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 she's the favorite person to win right now. So Ecuador could be rejoining the Bolivarian family. I mean, Guatemala, you know, a lot of repression right now to prevent fair elections. We got to analyze what's happening in El Salvador. Nicaragua is strong, but arguably Nicaragua is the most demonized country by imperialism in the uh, hemisphere. So that's the multipolar uh, uh, flavor of things going on. And every time I'm in Caracas, th yes, there's this Russian business representatives and there's Russian political representatives. And, and when I'm in Cuba, I was just in Cuba in December. And I can't tell you how many times the Cubans said if it wasn't for the Russians and their solidarity, the Russians send 1.5 million tons of grain last year. The Cubans said they would be starving if it wasn't for the Russians. Thank, thank you, Danny and Janet. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, and uh, thank you, Danny, for your great presentation. I may have missed it, but uh, I thought you were going to show some photos or video of that wealthy area uh, outside of Port-au-Prince. The um, that, That's what my question is. Thanks so much, Janet. Um, yeah, I can try to show some stuff. It's just kind of buried in my Twitter. So let me see what I can come up with as I multitask. Um, I'll do my best, but let's see if anyone else has a, a question as I look for it on my Twitter. Okay. Um, why don't we take a second for that and then give Danny a chance to look through his Twitter account. Yeah, I don't want to... Um, you know, waste anyone's time. I don't, is this, do you got, you said you take like a little break or something? Because I could find this stuff. It's going to take me a minute or two. Maybe we should go on. Janet, did you have anything else besides that? Or uh, otherwise I'll ask my question. No, that's it. Thank you. Okay, so Danny, um, you spoke just briefly, um, touched upon the role that Canada is playing in Haiti. And of course, Canada is, is uh, you know, a, uh, a, a sycophantic vassal of the United States, um, and it's playing that role to the hilt. What Canada does is really a surrogate for the United States. And then Canada also has some of its own interests, is probably lusting after some of the mineral, mineral resources in Haiti. Um, but it's still, it seems odd that Canada is playing such a leading role um, as a surrogate for the United States. Why? Because um, the United States has been shopping around for a long time looking for surrogates to uh, impose its its hegemony over, over Haiti. And basically, the people in the region, the Latin American and the Caribbean, they, they said, you know, take a hike. We're not going to um, join you in repressing Haiti. But Canada has just stepped up sort of not only volunteered, it seems like they volunteered and they've gone a step further. So can you illuminate a little, little bit of what your understanding of, is of the Canadian role in Haiti? Yeah, yeah, they, they've tried to be the uh, good cop to the U.S.'s uh, bad cop. Um, the U.S. has done everything in the past year plus since Ariel Henry requested their He's the Haitian prime minister, unelected, but uh, he's continually asked for a foreign um, intervention. And I mean, what what president would, if you're a true nationalist, a true person who defends Haiti, why would you ask the very forces who are responsible for the neocolonial disease to, quote unquote, bring the solution or the cure? It's um, it's ridiculous. Canada. There's an incredible documentary that we should watch um, called Haiti Betrayed. And it's all about the Canadian government and how they try to position themselves as these humanitarian, um, you know, the, 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 every, all their, their motivations are completely humanitarian. But the, the truth of the matter is that Canada is the mining arm of the G7 imperialist nations. Um, I think, uh, Canada is the leading mine of power in the entire world. Often when you when you look at this lithium resistance and the lithium triangle, 
And that's why the coup in Peru was, was so important to create divisions down there because they're so afraid of another Bolivia uh, in the Andes. I mean, when we talk about South America, we're talking about one of the richest, richest places on earth. The principal wealth of the world is concentrated where? South America, Middle East, Russia, Africa, certainly the U.S. and Canada have, have a fair amount of resources as, as, as well. Um, those Canadian mining companies are, are everywhere. And I think we have to continue to expose that. I was a bit naive myself over the years. And so many times in Ecuador or Colombia or the Dominican Republic, it was like, no, this is a Canadian company. And I was like, geez, the Canadians are just as bad as the gringos, is, is the U.S. And I, so I had to kind of rip the veil, that uh, veil of liberalism that Canada tries to uh, project. What the Haitians say are, you know, liberals, conservatives, these are the two wings of the same vulture seeking to consume us. So the, the, the Haitian revolutionaries see right through the hybrid warfare. Because what Roger outlines, that's what hybrid warfare is. Hybrid warfare is you don't have to send in the U.S. troops. You can deputize, deputize, deputize Bermuda, Bermuda or the Bahamas or one of these tiny Caribbean countries and just give them all the guns so they're the cannon fodder. <laughs> and they're going to go in and it might be useful for us to imagine, to visualize. What's it going to look like? Foreign soldiers in Port-au-Prince who don't speak a word of Creole who knew nothing of Haitian life and Haitian existence and, and, and the hunger <laughs> that motivates young people to join these gangs because they feel powerless. There's a psychological wage for a young man, the lumpen proletariat, suddenly is a gun, suddenly is an identity, somebody. People want to know who he is, what his name is. Before he's just dying of hunger, no one notices him. So into that maelstrom, into that conflagration, you're going to take foreign troops. I don't care if they're Canadian, Brazilian again. You know, hopefully not. I don't think Lula could ever. Lula and Jilma have never made a public um, apology. That's been something on the left. There's been a little bit of back and, and forth. Of course, the Black liberation fighters and leadership who are, who are in Atlanta right now for the Radical Black Organizing Conference, how could they ever respect uh, Lula? Hopefully they can see things um, in a dialectical way. But you know, occupying Haiti with Brazilian troops, the very Brazilian troops who occupy the favelas of Hosinha and, and, and the rest of the favelas in, in Rio de Janeiro. So they've been unsuccessful, as Roger said, deputizing, but that is their um, strategy because, you know, they're losing in, in Ukraine. I think yesterday, you know, I'm not going to go into analysis of what happened in Moscow yesterday or what didn't happen in Moscow because no shot was fired. Nobody was killed. This was not a legitimate real coup. Maybe he was measuring the waters, um, you know, the Wagner founder and stuff, but um, things aren't going well in Ukraine. You know, they just found an accounting error. So $6 billion more dollars to Ukraine. Well, if you made an accounting error, why not put the $6 billion into Oakland's schools and, and get some of the murals and graffiti back um, or invest it in the South Bronx? So it's, it's, it's in the range of $150 billion out of our tax paying money that's gone for this proxy war in, in, in Ukraine that they're losing, frankly. Thank you. So if we have no more questions, I'm going to ask Danny one final question. And, and But if there are some more questions, please raise your hand. And th that is to um, switch back to Venezuela, because Venezuela next year will be having a presidential election. And the, it's a very high stakes election. And so, Danny, I was wondering maybe if you could reflect a little bit about the stakes of that election and what it would mean for the struggle in Venezuela, in the region, and even internationally, if the Bolivarian Revolution would lose in this coming election. Oof. My goodness. Uh, <laughs> do we even utter those things out loud, Rod Roger? Um, the PSUV has... Uh, has stated in the past few months that Nicolas uh, Maduro Moros will again uh, run. They see him as, um, you know, their, their leader, as the most poised to carry the Bolivarian project uh, forward. I think us as leftists, I've talked about this um, over the years, I think it would be uh, very unfair and very haughty 
for us to be down on Nicolas Maduro. It feels like Nicolas Maduro and his cabinet, uh, of course there's mistakes in any war. And that's what it is, it's a war. The Venezuelan people have been under siege now, really since 1998 when Chavez won, but the imperialist economic war and hybrid war really ratcheted up in, in 2014 and Chavez dies in March of 2013. I mean, Nicolas Maduro had one of the most impossible jobs ever because you're following upon the heels of arguably, you know, the, the, the most important leader of the 21st century, perhaps in the world, right? What Hugo Chavez did. And the Venezuelan people are very, very Chavista people, you know? The Chavez um, portraits in the home and quoting Chavez and his his material that was on TV is still on TV. They continue to study Chavez, Diosdado Cabello with his his nightly television program, El Maso Dando, the, the, the mallet um, striking incredible show that we should uh study i think it i wrote i wrote a piece that you can um read where i looked at Diosdado cabello's leadership and his show is um an example of 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 building links between the masses and the revolutionary leadership and, and popular education cadre training uh all of that what i saw in venezuela was um chavista forces spread across the the country um continuing to struggle, you know, uh, amidst the blockade, but feeling some relief. I think they feel emboldened every time the, the Russians can come and there's new trade deals and the Iranians and the Chinese. Um, they've spoken out against, uh, of course, NATO and, and, and the U.S.'s surrounding of, of, of Russia. I don't think they have any illusions that, that, that Russia is Russia's obviously not some type of socialist power, but that Russia has stood up to, to NATO is, is, is heroic. From whatever angle we we analyze it from, um, so I think that's what's at stake now. To lose the the, the reason that Venezuela is, is is arguably the most vilified, even more than Cuba at times, if that's possible. I mean, Venezuela has massive resources, and when I was in Venezuela, it's when Trump came out with that crazy statement on the campaign trail in North Carolina. I don't know if you all heard it, but definitely check it out. Trump said. You know, this this bozo Biden, we were so close to getting all that oil. I just needed a few more months. And Trump's bragging. He's saying what we already know. And that's why Trump is so clumsy to the U.S. ruling class. They need a guy who's a puppet. And they can give him the teleprompters and he's going to stick to the script. And Trump doesn't do that. That's why they hate. They don't hate Trump because he's a white supremacist. They don't hate Trump because he's a fat. They hate Trump because he's bad for business. <laughs> so... When Trump made that statement, the vet, all the Venezuelans threw up their hands and said, well, this is what we've been saying for decades and even centuries that the open veins of Latin America, the open veins, to quote Eduardo Galeano, really the genesis of intellectually understanding the plight of this, of, of, of this, of this continent, the Venezuelans are saying, we've been saying this forever, but you need you know, Tweedledee to say it out loud so you can actually um, believe it. But even even the right wing opposition, which has been very, very fractured over time, when they heard Trump say that at the end of the day, they're Venezuelan, too. And they, they throw up their hands like this does not help our cause because it it further confirms that where who are we loyal to? We're doing the bidding of, of the U.S., whether it's the Democrats or the uh, Republicans. So. The right wing appears to be uh, pretty demoralized at the national level, but they'll continue to win their local races. Um, on the border states, it's uh, anti-Chavista governors. And that makes it very difficult because I, I think people forget too, when you look at the full sociological portrait, you know how many teachers in Venezuela have been harassed and fired because they're Chavista? Now, that might sound strange to you. Wait a minute. In Venezuela, Venezuela's Chavista, yes, nationally, one could say it, frame it that way. But there's 26 states plus the, the capital, right? And in many of those states, the right wing, anti-Chavista, anti-socialist, pro-U.S. is in power. So if you're a teacher in that state, if you're a doctor in that state, if you're a journalist in that state and you dare to defend the revolution, you're, you're under the gun, you're under attack. And that's within Venezuela. And I think U.S. Human Rights Watch and Amnesty are so hypocritical because they want to look at any mistake that the Bolivarian state might make, but they can ignore all of the horrific violence that the right wing continues to commit. Thank you. Um, I see um, Richard and Raj have their hands up. I guess I'll go in. I don't know who came first, but I'll, um, 
Go Rock with Rock Richard Rock. first. Go with Richard first. Richard, if you could speak, please. I agree. <laughs> I have a better question. <laughs> um, uh, <clears throat> I uh, uh, in in the chat I posted an article uh, that, that came out of uh, uh, um, courtside. Uh, of course, it's a, it's a um, uh, another. It comes from I think common common dreams maybe, uh, but it's on deliberism, and uh, it notes that um, that there's there's a um, uh, uh, that there's been a what used to be what used to be uh, could be counted on as far as you know political power um, uh, has, has seemed to have disappeared, uh, and sort of to me and sort of related to that is um, I think I, I I'm beginning to see maybe a, a waning of of uh, of political power by the um, the so you know the, the the solidarity uh, organizations out there. I don't know if you've seen that or not, uh, but I, I keep um, uh, I keep seeing um, articles about how um, uh, big people have gone to try and approach Congress, and they've been torn turned away. Um, yeah, and in large measure, they're they're associated with with these solidarity groups. Have you noticed that? And, and could you comment on that, if you would, please? Thank you. Yeah, what came up for me, Richard, if I understood correctly, is that the U.S. left um, is, of course, a very amorphous organism being. There's, there's many differences and ideological differences, which is, I think, of course, very natural and, 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 and healthy. I think when it comes to Haiti, um, it's an anti-imperialist struggle and whoever can line up on the correct side of the ideological barricades is with us. What I've seen is a little bit of infighting um, in the U.S. left. I mean, some of these solidarity groups are, are, are not that big, but because back in Haiti, this group identified with this leader in 2004 um, and because this solidarity activist took a picture with this individual there's these feelings, you know, well, if you work with them, we'll never work with you because in 2004, you took the wrong position and you didn't stand with Aristide during the coup attempt. And those are legitimate critiques. Those are important conversations. And, you know, people should be held to task for mis mistakes that they made. I don't care how big or, or tiny the organization, but I don't think right now Haiti needs any of us to be worried about what happened 20 years ago. Those conversations should be had, but I can just say in my own personal case, like coming back from Haiti doing this work, there's certain people who won't talk to me because I worked with this or that organization. And it's like, well, when you're in Haiti and that those are the people doing work and they're doing good work and they're expanding, uh, of course you want to work with them and you want to work with everybody and build as much unity as you can, which is really what the Haitian people are trying to do. So I think from the East Coast to the West Coast, we can do a, a, a better job. There's the old proverb from Cuba in critique of their own uh, historical left where they say, you know, Mucho de nosotros preferemos ser cabeza de ratón en vez de ser cola de león. Many leftists would prefer to be the um, the head of a mouse instead of being the tail of a lion. So there's always this problem with um, protagonism and who's in front of the media and who's the real leader and anything like that. Of course, in the words of George Jackson, we need to settle all of our quarrels and find a way to... Uh, work with one another because the 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 enemy, we know who the enemy is and we see how powerful the enemy is. The last thing we can afford is to be uh, trifling among ourselves with these arguments. Hopefully Richard, that 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 answered your, your question. I don't know so much about approaching US Congress men and women. We had a whole campaign against Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Richard Torres, and we shut them down in New York City and in the Bronx at different, um, um, military recruitment events that they have very hypocritically uh, held. But in term, I, I, I haven't seen any of those progressive squad members mention Haiti 
they'd probably be voting to just send the usual U.S. military assistance. I don't think they've been briefed. I mean, that's our job. They should be setting up um, opportunities with the Alexandria Ocasio-Cortezes and the Ileana Omars and Bernie Sanders so we can debrief them on what's truly happening in Haiti. But that's well, that was some sort of my point is, is that even the uh, AOCs of the world, uh, of, the, of the representatives, are turning them away. Well, that's my understanding. So I, I mean, so the, there's a there seems to be a lack of traction, you know, uh, in the political sphere uh, amongst amongst these solidarity groups or amongst these, you know, pro- I, I'm not sure exactly how you phrase it, but um, anyways. Okay, well, th- thank you, and, and then Raj. Yeah, so I want to. Um discuss a little bit with you, Danny, since we have time, the uh, question of imperialism and how uh, how the U.S. left is divided, not only on Western Hemisphere, but on Ukraine and uh, elsewhere. The United States used Latin America, South America, as its uh, domain to strengthen itself, get the resources of that and emerge as the preeminent imperialist power. You know, it it did that very successfully from 1898 onwards. It's uh, it's emerged by 1915. It already was the biggest economy, one of the biggest, I think it was the biggest economy, and the British Empire was going down. And so now the U.S. uh, leftists who are divided on this imperialism thing, one of the problems is that they do not understand the national question, the national question, national liberation. You know, the success of the Bolsheviks in Russia was that they understood the national question correctly and they linked it with the class question in a correct way. And they moved forward with that. Of course, the peasants were part of that uh, equation, right? The peasant, the peasant, the oppressed nationalities, you know, and and of course the working class. And the U.S. left, you have a division among. On our left is the left wing communists, you know, and on our right are the social democrats. Both left wing communists and social democrats, in a way, unite. Uh, by saying, look, uh, this uh, any opposition to U.S. imperialism, no matter where, unless it is pure, unless it is uh, led by working class and nothing else, and makes no compromises, <laughs> will is not worthy of support. And and the social democrats uh, say, well, you know, we should appeal to liberals and the left wing democrats, etc. Both are failing. There is no use. I mean, there, Modi came to uh, White House and was uh, treated very well. And they're trying to enlist India on the side of U.S. imperialism. And the people who oppose Modi's policy said we should go to sign this uh, petition to to the Congress that uh, Modi and uh, and the White House and the, and the State Department that Modi is doing bad things. So in my opinion, those are the people who don't understand how imperialism functions. And I like your comments on all that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, last week, we organized a study group with my union, the Professional Staff Congress. Um, that's actually, I think, how I originally, through Gary and uh, Manny Ness, found out about uh, about the Marxist uh, library. And I, I think some of my union members, uh, maybe Doug and other comrades are on, I'm not sure. But we just did a study group of this book, which I think people will be very interested in. I don't know if you've heard of Midwestern Marx. It's a very youthful uh, group of anti-imperialists um, led by Carlos Garrido, who's a Cuban-American. And he put out this book um, called uh, The Purity Fetish, a critique of Western Marxism. And he goes through the very points that Raj is is making and and it's not just the 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 far alienated left isolated left you know of course that that classic you know Lenin book about that that tendency the far left the know-it-all left who would prefer to frankly be in groups of 10 instead of being in groups of uh you know tens of of thousands 
I think uh, they end up on the same side too as often as um you know the the fascists and in, in the right wing um nowadays who where can you say something positive about Venezuela its revolution and its leadership as an academic if I were to build up Venezuela and defend Venezuela too much you know that's a reappointment letter that will not arrive in in August as journalists where can we publish totally in defense uh, you know, even, even in the left, the, the word Nicolas Maduro became a, a dirty thing. I mean, that shows you how powerful the ruling class was. And it's like, well, the, these these liberals who masquerade as leftists, I mean, they never read Malcolm X and Malcolm X's famous quote, like, never allow your enemy to determine for you who your friends and enemies are. And the newspapers and the media exist so that we become a tale to the bourgeois uh, kite of, of, of pro-imperialist ideology. So shame on, you know, I've had these different debates with people in the DSA. Um, you know, these, these are one of those moments where I always wish Gary was here because Gary was so clear. He had such ideological clarity uh, on these questions. Um, in my day, I'm 45 years old, so I cut my teeth as a student activist in 1996. And it's when the uh, ISO, you know, who I was always fond of calling the International Suburban Organization, and 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 they they had nothing but unfettered hatred for Cuba, for, for Nicaragua. And I, I was like, how do you not stand with? Now, for me, it's a very personal question, and this is when I get real Brockton and Bronx, and I talk about where I'm from because growing up. I knew what it meant to not have enough money to eat. And I knew what it meant that my mother had to work three jobs in a row and my mother was struggling and hustling. And my father wasn't there. So when I learned about Cuba, I felt an intrinsic, organic love and solidarity because the Cubans are doing the impossible. In the Libyans, as, as NATO and the US bombs away, the Libyans were trying to do the impossible and to line up against the Libyans at that moment, it, unforgivable. And we marched in, in Times Square in defense of Libya as those NATO bombs went off over Tripoli. And it was like 12 or 13 of us, arguably, well, the only other time I can think that we've ever been so small is when William Kamakado and the rest of the crew, when we're in front of the Venezuelan embassy in the winter in defense of Venezuela, sometimes it's like eight or nine of us, but I don't care if this, it's not important sometimes the quantity, but it's it's the quality that we're going to take that stand no matter how few of us there are, because it's the correct stand. And perhaps there was even more ideological confusion around Syria in the dirty war on Syria, because these hybrid wars are very clever. If there's no uh, images of U.S. troops invading, it's so much easier for the, the U.S. to clean their hands. 99, I'd say 99.9% .9 of the American public, or maybe just 99%, has no clue that U.S. intelligence, the Pentagon, the State Department, the CIA, coordinated with the Saudis and the Turkish and all these pro-terrorist Al-Qaeda outfits in, in Syria. If you said that to like my aunt and uncle and family members, they would say I was crazy, that I was a conspiracy theorist. So the amount of anti-imperialist education that we need to do in this country, you know, Cornel West said it. Cornel West said, um, I'm headed to Trump country. I'm going to go talk to them brothers and sisters. I mean, I, it's tough for me to call them brothers and sisters, but if Cornel West can do it, you know, and I think Cornel West, when he goes out there, is going to have some great conversations. And I hope it's well documented. And, and uh, you know, I guess that's kind of like the Freedom Riders of um, 2023, if you will. So hopefully, Raj, I responded to your uh, very important statement and question. Thank you very thank, much. Thank you, Danny. And, and thank you for the uh, plug for Midwest Marx. Um, they're good friends of the Sunday mornings at the Marxist Library. And in fact, just two weeks ago, uh, Carlos Garrido uh, spoke on his book, The, the Purity Fetish right here at, at, at this time. So I um, wanted to thank you and ask you if you had any um, final comments. And um, I know I've been addressing you as, as Professor um, Danny Shaw, which is an honorific, but um, I would say that there's an even higher honorific that we should be addressing Danny as. And D Danny is, is truly a comrade of the struggles for a better world. Uh, Danny, do you have any, um, Comrade Danny, do you have any um, final comments? Yeah. Roger, 
Roger, there is a hand up. Uh, could you take that question first? Oh, we okay. I'm sorry. This, which I, I, I know I didn't see that. Um, Rich and Jay, uh, unmute yourself, please. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I thought I was going to miss it here, but uh, this is personal, and uh, I just wanted to uh, speak uh, directly uh, 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 about Gary, who. Uh, you just met Danny, you just mentioned a couple of times, and uh, some people on this uh, program today won't, will not have known Gary Hicks. Uh, uh, quite a number will. Uh, of course, the, uh, <clears throat> the, the uh, planning committee that were setting up all these programs and everything, uh, they knew exactly who Gary was. But uh, I, I just want to speak to uh, you <clears throat> as a friend directly of Gary. Uh, and I know that because Gary talked to me about you. Uh, he talked to all of us about you, actually, if, if he heard it. But uh, uh, I know the connection. And uh, Gary would be very proud of you right now. I don't want, I want to uh, both uh, uh, <clears throat> express uh, uh, appreciation for your, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, your uh, teaching and your writing and your speaking uh, <clears throat> as a, a quote. Uh, uh, a, a member of the academy of the and, and you know professor um, but at the same time uh, like uh, not a lot of our people do but uh, we get some really good speakers uh, can get out to uh, Haiti <laughs> uh, Venezuela uh, Roger that makes a few trips but for sure but I'm just saying that uh, Gary would be very very proud of you uh, I'm getting a little emotional right now but uh, some of us uh, really were close with him and really miss him. And I just want to say thank you. Thank, thank you. Yeah, beautiful. And um, the tribute to Gary, I put it in the chat. I can uh, post it again. And as, as I wrote it, you know, I, I didn't grow up with a father figure. And there were just moments when Gary was there for me in very, very uh, beautiful, comradely ways. And, and Drew King, another young comrade close to uh, Gary, I wish he was here. And, 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 and Wadi, um, Wadi, who's based out of uh, Cambridge in, in Boston, he might be on the call, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm actually supposed to get together with him. Um, yeah, so many fond memories. And, and that's why I wanted, I, I wanted to write the tribute to Gary, because I think telling the truth about Gary and his ideological stances in, in people's world um, published that. I think it's a calling. I think it's a calling for a lot of um, young communists and communists in general to get these things correct, to go back to the books, to go back to the the study. I mean, we can't afford to misunderstand Haiti and Venezuela and in the Chinese Revolution. And yeah, I see a comment here about, about Cornell West. No, yeah, Cornell West doesn't have uh, the, the the pure pure line, perhaps on why Russia was forced into this, you know, special military operation, as they call it, which is nothing more than a war, of course, with the Ukrainian families trapped in the middle, uh, really victims of of NATO and the U.S. Um, Cornell West is going to make mistakes. You know, it's never going to be chemically pure. Um, and I think that's what uh, Carlos Garrido's is, is, is book. Uh, I'll repost the tribute. Somebody asked for it. Somebody asked me a question about Chile. Yeah, I mean, Gabriel Boric, I think very, very, very symbolic, emblematic of how the Chileans, not the Mapuches, not the indigenous nation, but the Chileans, similar to the Argentinians, have had uh, some relative privilege, some white privilege, some material privilege uh, over the years. And Gabriel Boric has not thrown his lot in with the other Bolivarians. Gabriel Boric, to his eternal, you know, uh, critique, has spent more time criticizing Havana in Caracas than criticizing Washington, D.C., which is unforgivable, which puts him really in the ideological camp of the of the enemy. Um, I will find uh the tribute again and repost it. I wasn't able to go back through my whole Twitter. I'm just going to put my Twitter again, and it's chronological. Um, I interview one thing I didn't get a chance to talk about the targeting of these revolutionary leaders, how many gun battles, how many stray bullets, state bullets that they've survived. That's what we're trying to um, to document right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I see Yosef will have a final question. If we can make it brief, because we're going 
now against our time limit? Uh, no, I just want to say uh, you mentioned Erdogan, and if you email me, I, I left my email on the chat. Uh, uh, I could uh, clarify. I've been asked about Erdogan's foreign policy a lot, and I could uh, answer. I'm Turkish. Uh, Great, myself. I appreciate that. Okay, th thank you. So, Danny, um, do you want to have leave us with some final thoughts or sum up? Um, you, you've done a terrific job in sort of educating us and inspiring us, but are there, are there some final words? Yeah, um, I guess for my final words, what you know, I'll just I'll just take you to my Twitter so you can see some of the popular education work. Papa Doc talked all about identity politics, and Papa Doc was quote unquote, you know, the great black leader of Haiti, and he as he tortured and kidnapped upwards towards 60,000 Haitian leftists were, were, were murdered. Um, this is in the Dominican Republic. I gotta go back a little further to, to, to Haiti, but I just wanna give you a, uh, oh, this was our um, demonstration against the Clintons at, uh, at, at Columbia. Columbia appointed the uh, Clintons. This is Dr. Ariel Henry, the prime minister big protests against him and you see his motorcade. So it's just like infinite, infinite information. Um, uh, here, here, here I did a whole, th th people will find this interesting. This is a whole thread I did on why does Hater reserve a special hatred for the Clintons? In three words, US imperial arrogance. In 13 words, the Clintons are the face and personification of the failed NGO, humanitarian, liberal charity, imperialism model imposed on Haiti. Here are 10 facts to consider. So, you know, I'll, I'll put that link there as well. So you continue to see my work. Uh, I wrote a um, proposal to CUNY, City University of New York. So I'm going to try to go to the south of Haiti. I've actually never been to the south of Haiti. It's tough to travel in Haiti because the infrastructure is not what one would expect in uh, the 21st century. And I've never been to the actual south. So I want to go get a... Port-au-Prince is too dangerous to do the educational work we're doing right now. So what we're trying to do is take the leaders who are most targeted, who are the true leaders, and we're trying to take them out of the cauldron that is Port-au-Prince to the safer areas of Haiti where they can use all of their organizing experience and 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 build in the different... in the countryside and in the neighborhood. So hopefully I'll be in Jeremy in the beginning of uh, August and... Well, I really appreciate um, everybody. You know, I, I look up to to you all the way I looked up to to Gary. Um, I think the greatest mark of a revolutionary is what revolutionaries are you training? And Roger's done a great job, and 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 everyone here. You know, I don't know everybody, but uh, really appreciate the critical dialogue, the appreciation for for dialectics, and um, it could not come soon enough for. The toiling peoples of of the world, you know, the the, the Haitians are the anonymous heroes, as are the uh, Venezuelans. Thank you, Comrade Danny, and thank you to all the other comrades for joining us. And we'll see you at the next session. Good evening and good afternoon, and good good night. <laughs>
B-A-U-M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Nebro Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue, Oakland, California, 94609. Or directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml info for information write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org and the website is marxistlibr.org